you're a, you're an expert in nutrition and weight loss as well. What are some of the biggest mistakes people make in trying to lose weight? We're we're in mid December. January first is coming, where everybody's going to start their resolutions. What are some of the big mistakes that people are going to make? Wow, that is some topic. Um, <laughs> well, let's start with the dietary advice. Mm -hmm. you know, um, God, I'm, I'm going to try to condense a lifetime. I mean, I could talk about this for two hours. Um, Let's start with the information. There's two things to losing weight. There's the information, and there's putting it into practice. I used to start a lot of talks when I'd say, how many of you people out there would like to lose five or 10 pounds? Entire group. Everybody. Raised. How many of you know exactly what you need to do? The whole audience raised. How many of you are doing it? And everybody <laughs>, laughs. So information's the first part. Putting it into action's the second part where the psychology comes in. So let's first talk about the first part. First of all, most of us don't know what to do. And that part of the audience will say, I know what to do, low-fat diet, high carb. It's not the right advice. Um, and this is where it kind of dovetails with my interest in the whole cholesterol thing. Because if you ask most of those people, they'll say, yeah, what's my perfect breakfast? I know what I should be eating. Special K and orange juice and a bagel because it's low fat. And you know, no, that's the worst breakfast possible because that's going to send your blood sugar and your insulin through the roof and it's going to start fat storage, especially in people who are susceptible to that. And there's, and there's a huge number of uh -huh. us. So first thing is to get the right information. Part of the reason we have such bad information, not the whole reason, but part of the reason is because of the sphere of cholesterol. So we've been told don't eat saturated fat, don't eat fat at all. Well, now they modified it. And, well, you can eat some fat, but don't. No. The fear of fat has informed these dietary prescriptions, and they're wrong. And the American Dietetic Association, as I wrote on the Huffington Post, though it was censored, is probably the most destructive organization in America when it comes to When I hear a spokesperson from the American Dietetic Association says this, I run the other way. Um, so the information about high-carb, low-fat diets has been wrong, and it has been very insulogenic. It's been a, a, an eating style that is, is bound and determined to drive your fat storing hormone, insulin through the roof. Uh -huh. So we need to go back to a more traditional way of eating. Again, those four food groups, the foods you could hunt, fish, gather up. Um, buffalo burger for breakfast, or if full eggs, and God, these cockamamie egg white omelets. The yolk has got all the good stuff in it. So you know, the stuff that satiates, the stuff that really has protein and fat and fiber, lots of vegetables. Um, a different style of eating, number one. So that's one of the first mistakes people make. The second mistake they make is thinking that one diet fits all. And getting our dietary information from People magazine and go, well, Beyonce was on that diet. I guess it'll work for me. Well, it worked for Beyonce. It doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Not everybody does well with grains. Not everybody does well with dairy. Not everybody does well with a high-protein diet. M most people do better with that, but not everybody. There are people who will do quite well with a, a, a you know, I, I talked in one of my books about the Bantu of South Africa, of South Africa, 80% carbohydrate diet. They're the leanest people in the world, but th they wouldn't recognize what we eat as carbs, <laughs> what they eat uh. as carbs. Um, so that's a, that's a big factor as well. So people are genetically, metabolically different. There is no one diet that works for everybody, but I, I think, so that's, that's the second mistake. And the third mistake is thinking that this doesn't have a psychological component. We have brain chemistry that compels us to eat. You know, our, we have hormones that compel us to eat. Uh -huh. like leptin, uh, if, it, if we're leptin resistant, our brain isn't getting the signal to, hey, dude, you're full, stop. You know, uh -huh. it doesn't get there. So there's, there are hormonal reasons. Um, I think we have to break some of the chains that these, some of the ties that these foods have over us. These foods, if you, you read David Kessler's wonderful book, The End of Overeating, he was the former FDA commissioner. He wrote a book called The End of Overeating, details how the food industry has done what the tobacco industry did. Nicotine's addictive, but ain't that addictive. What the cigarette companies did is they added chemical after chemical after chemical to these cigarettes to increase the addictiveness of nicotine. This, is, this isn't controversial. It's out there. It, we, we know this. Food companies do the same thing. They scientifically layer the food with just the right amounts of uh, salt, fat, and sugar in just the right proportions, and then you wind up with an ad campaign that's truthful that says, bet you can't eat just one, and you can't, because that stuff is addictive. So we need to start treating ourselves as the food addicts that we are. And that means stealing a lot of material from AA, <laughs> because we have become powerless over the smell of a Cinnabon in the food court. And just knowing that you're not supposed to eat it doesn't, I have never seen anybody in my life 
and nor has anyone listening to this, who threw their cigarettes away and, and said, I never knew. You mean this stuff causes lung cancer? Oh my God, get these out of here. No, nobody's smoking today because they didn't get the memo on lung cancer. And nobody's eating high sugar foods because they didn't get the memo that they're not good for you. So there's something going on in brain chemistry. Dopamine gets fired and goes, gotta have it, gotta have it, mm -hmm. gotta have it. We have to find a way to disable that. I, I did a diet program, first one I've ever done in, in 20 years that uh, has one third of the, the program is about breaking those addictive ties. If you don't treat that, if you just give people a diet to eat, they will be done in three weeks. Mm -hmm. They will not stick to it. You gotta disable that. And my, and my program, Shameless Plug, Unleash Your Thin, you can see it on my website, has an entire section of just about like what, what are my trigger foods? And how do I, and it doesn't mean you'll never be able to eat them again or that you won't be able to enjoy them recreationally. My God, I, if I couldn't have been in Jerry's once in a while, I'd come. The point is that they're no longer addictive substances that you can't be without, that you use for every stressful event in your mm -hmm. life to self-medicate. And if we don't treat that part of the diet equation, we're kind of doomed because we're going to be addicts being sent back into a bar. This is a toxic food environment. And, and, the, and the odds are, the, the deck is loaded against us. It's, to me, it's a miracle anybody loses weight and keeps it off at all, mm -hmm. given the odds of what we have to deal with in the toxic food environment. So I think those are some of the mistakes that yeah. we make when it comes to dieting and, and weight loss.